Well, good morning. Thank you so much. For those of you that are here, thank you for being here. I don't know about you, but I'm just excited to be able to see people face to face. For all those of you that are joining us online, we can't wait to see you again as well. But in the meantime, until you feel comfortable, we're perfectly okay with you using technology. Aren't you glad that we have technology like this to be able to use so that we can stay together? Now, understand this. We are one church in many locations right now. And uh, so we're very excited for those of you that are joining us online today from your home or wherever you can get some free Wi-Fi. And we are so very glad that you have come together with us today. Well, today I want to talk to you about uh, how to deal with uncertainty. How do you act in uncertain times? This is a very important thing because I want you to understand something. If you're a follower of Christ... If you obey what the Bible teaches us, you're still going to have uncertainty in your life. It is completely normal for you to feel fear during times like this. Completely normal when things are uncertain to be a little bit filled with anxiety, maybe to have a few worries, to have a few fears. See, this idea that you won't have any of these is really not how the Bible describes it, how you're to act. I think sometimes as a pastor, maybe I've been guilty of uh, communicating this without meaning to, that, you know, hey, if you're a Christian, you should never have any fear or you should never worry. Well, that's actually not true. What you do with your fear and your worry and your anger and your emotions, that is what determines how you're going to live. It determines what kind of Christian you're going to be. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have fear. Obviously, during a time of financial upheaval for many people, there's going to be uncertainty in your life. There are going to be things you worry about. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that what we're to do is we're to cast all of our worries and our cares on Him, on God, because He cares for us. And so, The measure of your Christianity is not, do I never have fear? Do I never have anything to worry about? But rather, when you have those fears and when you have those worries, what do you do with them? Do you stew in it? Do you live in it? Do you wallow in it? Do you just say, I'm never going to get out of this? Or do you say to God, Lord, here, you take this. Now, I don't know about you. But I've practiced this a lot in my life. I've worked really hard at giving God all my fears, my anxieties, my worries. But have you ever done this? Maybe I'm the only one that's ever done this, but I bet you've done this as well. I come to God and say, Lord, here are my worries. I'm giving you my fears. I'm giving you my anxiety. And I'm laying it at the foot of Jesus. And I turn and I walk away. Look at my watch. I'm like, all right, you haven't done anything yet, Lord, but uh, I've got some faith. I'm going to trust you. If you're not going to do anything about it, I'm just going to take it back, and we pick it right back up. Anybody ever been guilty of that? I know I have. And the fact is, what you do in these times of uncertainty really determines how you're going to live your life. So I want to talk to you about how to thrive when things are uncertain. Now, I want you to understand, disease, financial uncertainty, fear is nothing new to the world, nothing new to our culture, and certainly nothing new to the world. These things have happened all throughout history, okay? But as we're going to look today, in the Bible, there is a I believe the greatest message ever preached was preached by Jesus. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, he gave us the way to deal with this uncertainty. Did you know that in Jesus' day, it's very similar to what we go through today. Did you know that there was financial uncertainty when Jesus was here on the earth? You see, in Israel, which was a subject of the Roman Empire at the time, kind of a small kingdom, um, did you know that The Roman government had made it legal for tax collectors to take stuff from you without any explanation, without any proof that you owed it. You really were at their mercy. 
and there really was no recourse. You couldn't take it to a court. Those tax collectors could take whatever they wanted of your money. Financial uncertainty. You can imagine the fear, the anxiety that that caused. Uh, Did you know that during the time that Jesus was here on earth, when he was preaching this sermon, in fact, did you know that they could literally and legally, Roman soldiers, they could strike you, they could beat you up. Thus, remember when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, okay? He was talking about that. They could literally strike you without uh, any repercussions whatsoever. Did you know that during Jesus' time, a Roman soldier could require that a Jewish citizen, by law, would carry his gear for at least a mile. It didn't matter what your schedule was. It didn't matter what you were doing. They could literally make you, force you to carry their gear for a mile. Did you know that uh, often they would sue people and they would take their cloak, which was very important because people often slept with that. It was their blanket. It was what kept them warm at night, and it literally could destroy a person's life. Now, I want you to understand what Jesus said to do was unheard of at the time. Once again, he's preaching this message. Um, Matthew recorded it. He was one of Jesus' disciples. He recorded it in the Gospel of Matthew. Other Gospels have parts of this message But Matthew has the most complete parts of it. Now, likely, uh, Jesus didn't just preach this one time. And most likely, it was stuff that he said again and again and again because the Gospel of Matthew was written some 35 years or so after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and by what he remembered, Matthew recorded for us what Jesus said, okay? Now, I want you to understand the fear factor that was going on in that culture how that they felt like they had enemies. I can imagine that I would feel that way. I mean, if somebody could strike me, beat me up with no repercussions for me in the court system. If somebody could take my stuff, legally take my stuff that I had worked for and they could steal it from me. Um, If I could be forced to work by a tyrannical government when I didn't want to, I can imagine that there would be anger and emotions and fear and anxiety that would build up within me as well. So I want you to picture that's the setting when Jesus said some of the most famous things that he ever said. He said, love your enemies. Wait, what? What are you talking about, Jesus? He said, if someone strikes you on the cheek, give them the other side to strike as well. And I got to be honest, that's probably one of the most difficult things that I've ever heard or read that Jesus said. That would be one of the most difficult things for me to, to live by, okay? He said, if someone takes your cloak, offer them your shirt as well. What? Are you kidding? He said, if someone c- tells you to carry their gear for a mile, say, oh no, I'll carry it too. Now, the fact is, that was radical stuff. And the fact is, when they heard that in their day, they reacted like you and I would react to that. But when you stop and think about it, not only do you know that this is not only the wisest, most incredible stuff that's ever been said, we know intrinsically in our heart that it's true, that it's right, that if we don't want to overcome the anxieties and the fears and the strife in our life, we do what Jesus said. We love. We love our enemies. I mean, anybody can give to people that gives back to them, right? Anybody can do that. Anybody can love people that love them. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Anybody can do that. Anybody can uh, love your friends, but it takes real love from God to love your enemies. Once again, he's not talking about emotional love. He's not saying that you have to feel like, well, this person that just beat me up and stole my stuff is now going to be my best friend. That's not what he's saying. The word love there is an action-based love. It is doing and acting like God would have you to act. And the bottom line is that we know 
that even though it's normal for us to have anxiety and fear, I mean, look, let's be honest. Uh, if you have small children and they're normally in school and now they're at home and you're having to make sure that they get their online teaching and you're trying to teach them, you're probably about fed up to hear with it, right? You're like, somebody please take these children off my hands, right? I mean, there's anxiety that goes with that. I've read that there are a lot of people that are dealing with anger, and, and rightfully so, lost your job. Some people feel like that, you know, there's a lot of oppression going on. Some people feel like that we're being required to do stuff that maybe is a little bit overreacting. Then there are others that think, oh, no, they're not doing enough, okay? So there's real fear or anger or anxiety that comes with that. Because of the financial uncertainty, because of all this, it is completely normal for us to feel these emotions. But I want you to understand that how you react during uncertainty and during a storm reveals your true self. Once again, Jesus was not saying you should never have those emotions. You should never have those fears. You should never have that anxiety, but rather... You should live like a kingdom subject. You should live like a child of God. You should live like a follower of Jesus Christ. And when you have those things that come your way, you give them to him. So we're going to pick up in this message. Now, once again, I don't have time to read the entire sermon that Jesus gave. But I want to have this one verse as a starting point. We're reading from the message paraphrase. He says, in a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects, now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. And I love this. The fact is that Jesus was showing us three things. Now, in this sermon today, I want to show you three things that Jesus says and three practical applications of how to do these three things. Okay? All right, so we're going to see three things. And then three ways to do this, all right? So he says, grow up, look up, and reach out, all right? Those of you online, join us in this. Grow up, look up, reach out. So what does Jesus mean when he says that? Well, he said, grow up. What I'm saying is, grow up. And he's talking about maturity. Have you ever noticed that a child does not possess the ability to be mature. Why? Because they're a child. They're not grown up yet. If you take a toddler's toy, they could have a whole stack of toys, and you take that one toy, and they're just devastated. They're immature. They'll pitch a fit. They'll lie on the floor and kick their feet. Why? Because they're not very mature. They're just a toddler. You can take a two-year-old with a stack of toys this high, And you can have another two-year-old come in with one single itty-bitty toy. And you know what this one wants over here that's got the big stack of toys? She wants that one that this little kid's got, right? Why? Because they're immature. They're just not very mature. When I was a teenager, I was still not very mature because I was a teenager. I remember growing up on my grandpa's farm, working on the farm, and one of the privileges that I had because it was out in the country, dirt roads and stuff, I started driving when I was 12 years old. I'd drive my grandpa's old farm truck, drive it around. I loved that. It was awesome. And one day my grandmother, she was on the other side of this field, and she yelled at me to come over there to where she was. Now, being 14 and having the keys to my grandpa's truck, did I walk? Not on your life. Uh, Did I take the road around this field? Not on your life. I got in the car, the truck, and I drove across this freshly plowed, wet field. Well, you can guess that I got stuck about halfway across, and it was a disaster. They had to send a tractor out to pull me out and all this stuff. And when I got on the other side, my grandma looked at me. She said, Richie, you need to grow up. I won't tell you what my grandpa said because you can't say that kind of stuff in church. But nevertheless, I needed to grow up. The problem was I was just not very mature. And that's normal for a teenager. That's normal for a kid. We've all seen a parent and child in Walmart or some other public place. 
and there's bargaining and yelling and pitching a fit and begging, and that's just the mom talking to the little kid, right? Why do they act that way? Because they're not mature. Here's what Jesus said, that if you're going to handle life, and if you're going to live like a Christian, like a kingdom subject, there has to be some maturity. you got to understand that if I'm going to look at life and not be constantly filled with fear, constantly filled with anxiety and worry, constantly filled with anger, then i got to grow up. i got to be mature. I, I've got to have the grown-up way, if you will, spiritually grown-up way of looking at life. Because everything's not going to turn out exactly like you want it. Everything's not going to be exactly peaches and cream all the time. But when I have spiritual maturity, I can handle it. He says there, just grow up. He says, live like kingdom subjects. He said that what you and I must do is live like, live out our God-created identity. I'm afraid there are a lot of Christians that are not mature yet. And as a result, they don't live out their God-given identity. They're like, well, you know, the truth is, I just, um, I just have an anger problem. Well, the truth is, by nature, I'm just not a very patient person. Well, in Galatians 5, it talks about the works of the flesh. A work is something that I do. But the fruit of the Spirit is something that God does. And it says in Galatians chapter 5, if I depend on myself, I'm going to produce works of the flesh. And they never work out. But the fruit of the Spirit, you see, God, only God can grow fruit. I can water, I can sow, but I can't grow fruit. Only God does that. And he said, Paul wrote in Galatians, he said, um, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, goodness, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. Now, what does that mean? It means that God says that my new identity when I'm a follower of Christ, maybe you're not a patient person by nature, but God will grow in you the fruit of the Spirit. So through the Spirit of God in you, He will enable you to be more patient. That's what it means when it says you live out your God-given identity. You see, the fact is, there are a lot of people that they depend on their past to identify them, what they used to do, how they failed in the past. The sins of their past defines their life. But God says that's not the way to be defined. You either believe the truth of God or you believe the lies of the devil. So many Christians, they have not realized that spiritual maturity does not necessarily correlate with having been in church for 40 years. I know a lot of people that have been going to church for 40 years of their life, and they're still not spiritually mature. Spiritual maturity, God works in you. You depend on Him, and we get the Word of God in our life and let it change our lives. That's how you begin to be spiritually mature. So God says, Jesus said, you got to grow up. Then He said, you got to look up. That's just simply prayer. You got to realize there are people around you watching you. You got to live out this kingdom identity. You got to live like a kingdom subject. And then you got to reach out. That's your witness. Now, you understand that when the Bible was written, they did not put verses and chapters to begin with. Most of the books of the Bible were written to be read in one sitting. Not all of them, but like the book of Psalms. But most of the books in the New Testament were written to be read in one sitting, all right? So the book of Matthew, when he wrote it, he didn't put chapter 6, verse 1. That was added later, okay? And the reason they added that is so that you and I could find where we wanted to read, okay? So those are not inspired, the chapters and verses. It's the, the text of what was written that God guided these men to write, okay? So uh, and. My point for telling you this is that Jesus continues this message, okay? So he says what we just read, and then he gives us a couple of other ways to make this very practical. So we got to grow up, look up, and reach out. Well, then he says in the verse after that, he says, but be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, 
but the God who made you won't be applauding. Now, what was Jesus saying there? He said, you gotta, you got to grow up spiritually, maturity. you got to look up, that's prayer. you got to reach out, that's my witness. But he says, you got to be authentic. That's all he's saying. Don't put on a show. You ever notice that a lot of people will put on a show when it comes to going to church? They want to put up the false front. They want to pretend that they have no sin. They want to pretend that they never face any issues. And Jesus said, that is not the way to impress your heavenly father. He says he won't be applauding that. Now, that does not mean that you need to live a life of giving out too much information. I've had some people in church over the years, they want to tell me every ailment that they've had and all. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Please don't tell me that. I don't want to hear that. That's too much information. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You have somebody in your life like that. They just are willing to gush out too much information. He's not saying that you need to talk about your hemorrhoids to everybody that comes around, okay? What he's saying is you got to be authentic. You got to be real. Uh, Don't be a pretender. Don't live the Christian life like it's some kind of performance. Well, then he goes on and he says something very practical. Teaching us, once again, because this is one narrative, this is one sermon, teaching us how to make application of these things in our life. He says, if you want to you uh, grow up and look up and reach out, you've got to be real about it. And then he says, there are three things you can do. Now, the interesting thing is, these three things, some of them seem to make sense, but one of them doesn't make sense. But... In these verses that follow, Jesus tells us exactly how to be authentic and real in doing this. He said three things. He said, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. Now, he didn't say if you do these things. He said when you do these things. So let me read with you. First of all, in thriving in a time of uncertainty, you want to be authentic in your Christian life you got to help someone personally. Help someone personally. That's the give part. Listen to what he said. He said, thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees all or who sees in secret will reward you. Now, this is very simple what he's saying. He's not suggesting that nobody can ever know that you gave. I mean, like, you don't need to come to the pastor after service and say, uh, don't tell nobody, but uh, here's this envelope. It's got some money in it for the church. That's not what he's saying. He's saying don't do it to show off. Don't do it to pretend to be something that you're not. Don't do it. To get the approval of everybody else. Because what you're doing, you're doing this to get the approval of God, not everybody else. All right? Now, he said something very funny. He said, don't sound a trumpet before you like some people do. Now, when we read that, we're like, I guess Jesus is just trying to be funny. But actually, did you know that that actually happened in Jesus' day? When people would go to the synagogue or to the temple to give, they would literally hire trumpeters or people that would blow ram's horns, to be more accurate, uh, the shofar, to dance before them and to play music before them. Da-da-da! Richie's coming to give. Everybody pay attention. Richie's going to give. Da-da-da! He puts it in the offering. Well, that's dumb, all right? What if we did that in our church? You know, passing the buckets, for those of you that still give by putting in the bucket, and you stood up and you had a quartet around you that start, suddenly started to sing about the money that you were going to put in the offering. Well, that would be silly. And the fact is, his point was very strong. That if you're going to practice these things, living as a kingdom subject, one thing you got to do is you got to give for the right purpose. And when he said there, give to the needy. Give to the needy. So in other words, you got to worry about people other than yourself. You got to help people that are going through this thing with you. You got to think about others, not just yourself. And I've been so proud of so many of you that even during this time, you have been able to help others. I've heard so many stories 
of people from our church reaching out to others. I know that our staff has made thousands of contacts during this time of people that are going through needy times and so forth. And I've been so proud of how so many of you have ministered to others. You got to help someone personally. Here's the second thing. You got to talk to God privately. You got to talk to God privately. Look at what he said. He said, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can imagine, or manage rather. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with and he knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. I love this. Once again, he's not suggesting that it's wrong to pray in public. What he's saying is you don't pray to try to impress somebody else. You ever had somebody do that in front of you? I remember the kind of church that I went to when I was a kid. They would have a deacon or a pastor or a staff member come up and pray during the service. And often they would use language that nobody in their right mind would ever use in normal everyday talking. Our most benevolent and gracious heavenly father. They get that kind of faraway sound in their voice, you know. Thou who hast made the universe, the propagator of life. Who says propagator of life, all right? And and the point was that there were people that they thought that made them sound more spiritual, but it doesn't. God says, you want to be more spiritual? You want to be closer to me? You want to live like a kingdom subject? He said, just talk to me. Just talk to me. And I love what he said there. He said that when you pray... The focus will shift from you to God. And once again, he's not suggesting you shouldn't pray for your problems. You should. We should pray for healing and protection. We should pray for the finances. But when you come in all worried, this illustrates what we do. Oh, God, please don't let me lose my job. Oh, God, please supply my need. I'm so afraid of what this economy is doing. Oh, God, please protect me and my family. Oh, God, don't let my kids get sick. Oh, God, help my mom, help my dad. Nothing wrong with praying those things. You should pray that. But the more I get real with God, he said the focus shifts from me. This is what prayer is about. It shifts from me and my problems to God. The more I pray, the more I talk to him, the more I'm real with him. Should I still ask God for healing? Yes. But all of a sudden, my focus turns toward the awesomeness of God. God, your mercy endures forever. God, your grace is forever. God, thank you that you're so awesome and you're a healer and you just begin to praise God. And it brings peace in your life. The very thing that you're seeking, that very thing that will solve the anxiety, the worry, the problems, you'll shift your focus from you to God. Well, the third thing you need to do is you need to discipline yourself purposefully. In other words, that's what fasting is about. Look what Jesus said about fasting. He said, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so that people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, then no one will notice that you're fasting except your father who knows what you do in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. Now, I find this very interesting. The fasting part doesn't seem to fit. But he says, if you want to be this kingdom subject, you want to be spiritually mature, you want to grow, you you want to... You want to look up, you want to pray, you want to reach out, you want to be the right witness and the right testimony, helping others. He said you got to do three very practical things. you got to give, you got to pray, you got to fast. Now, there are many reasons for fasting in the Bible. There are people that fasted for healing, for ministry, for their family, for interceding, for health, for finances, and I could go on and on. But the point is this, you can participate and thrive during 
uncertain times. Now, here's what I want to call you and challenge you to do. Because this is a very practical message. I love how Jesus made things within reach. Okay, sometimes they sound hard. Love your enemies, really? Turn the other cheek, really? Um, you know, if they take your cloak, offer your shirt too, really? They tell you to carry their gear for, gear for a mile, offer to do too. And what he's saying is this, you got to have a different focus. you got to have a different attitude than everybody else. you got to look to God and live a kingdom life. And he says, one of the ways you do this is you give, you pray, and you fast. What I'm going to call you to do this week, I'm going to call you to give. Now, just so that you won't think that I'm trying to do this to take advantage of people that Maybe some are losing jobs or, you know, having financial problems. This is not about filling the coffers of Avalon Church. Obviously, we want you to give and tithe like you normally do. But this giving that I'm calling you to today is a very simple thing. We're going to help people in need. Not about us. There is a group of people in our culture that are the most vulnerable. They've lost their jobs. Uh, A ministry partner of ours in Charlotte, North Carolina is called Camino Church. We help sponsor that church financially to get it off the ground. Rusty Price, the pastor of that church, has been to our church a couple times and preached. We gave them money to plant churches in Central and South America and in Cuba. I've preached in some of those churches. Um, we've, had, they, we've had them for a ministry partner for a while. One of the things that they have there in Charlotte, North Carolina, at their church, they have a medical clinic that is absolutely free. They have very good doctors that offer this free medical, not just advice, but services for uh, people in that community. But they also have a very large food pantry. And Rusty told me just a couple weeks ago, he said, for $20, for $20, you can feed a family that is out of work for an entire week. $20. And what I want you to do is I want you to give And if you're going to give toward this, in other words, helping people in need, you can either give at avalonchurch.net forward slash give. You just, when you give, put in the word food, F-O-O-D, food. If you give by text, 84321, you once again, put in the word food, food, all right? If you want to mail it in, you can put in the memo at the bottom, food, all right? And what this does is that for every $20 that comes, we're giving 100% of that to those in need, all right? Now, some of you are like, well, I can afford $20, most everybody. I would challenge you, even if you've lost your job, do this in faith and watch and see how God provides for you. There are many of you that'll do much more than that. You'll feed five families for a week or 10 families for a week or whatever you feel like doing. But we can all give. We can all pray. I'm calling our church to 24 hours of prayer and fasting on April the 29th. That's this Wednesday. We'll start at 6 a.m. and go through 6 a.m. the next day. You say, well, what is that for? Now, I'm not expecting you to pray for 24 hours, all right? But to fast for 24 hours and then pray during that time. If you want to be a part of this, you don't really have to sign up. This is just to let us know who all is going to do it. Text the number 833-520-0641. You can look at that, take a picture of it. It'll be online. You can text that as well, all right? So that just simply lets us know who participates. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have on avalonchurch.net, we're going to have uh, on Tuesday, we'll have it up of how you can pray, all right? I've put together a list to help you to pray. Some of you have never prayed for an hour. Now, you don't have to pray for an entire hour. Some of you may want to pray in the morning, at lunch, and at night. Some of you want to pray for an entire hour. Some of you might want to pray for 30 minutes. But we're going to fast, do them without food, for 24 hours, and we're going to pray as a church. Now, what we will help you with in this is if you will go to avalonchurch.net on Tuesday, you can find how to pray the Lord's Prayer. I've got this broken down for you, how to pray Bible verses and claim them, how to pray for a prayer list. We've got a list of things to pray for. And then how to pray the names of God. I promise you, if you'll pray through these things, you'll pray longer than you're used to praying and it'll be a very helpful tool for you to pray. When you give, 
when you pray, when you fast. Now, there are some people that because of a medical condition, they cannot fast without food for 24 hours. Some people have diabetes. I understand that. Maybe what you would do for that 24 hours is give up something that you normally would take into your body, like coffee. I know for some of you, you're like, no, let me go without food for a a week rather than do without coffee for a single morning. Whatever it is you choose to fast for that 24 hours, fast and pray and give, and I believe God will bless you. Now, what are your next steps? Well, if you're watching online, your next step might be to fill out the next step card. You can find that in the description there. Give us your information and how you're interested in Avalon Church. Maybe you'd like to sign up for the online next step class. You can actually do that online. Once we get everyone back to normal, we will have these offered once a month live here at the physical location of the church. But you don't have to wait. You can take the next step there. Maybe you'd like to get signed up for baptism or signed up for church membership. Excuse me. Uh, So just do that, whatever your next step is. Maybe your next step is to give, to help somebody with food today. But whatever it is, you feel free to take that next step. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Those of you online, so glad that you joined us today. Once you start feeling more confident, we can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see you face to face. It's so exciting for me to even see some people here today. I'm very happy about that. Very glad to get out of the house. And uh, maybe another week or two, you'll feel comfortable in doing that. I can't wait to see you. But thank God, in the meantime, we can stay connected. One church in many locations, we stay connected through our technology. I want to thank all of you that came physically to the church today. It is very good to see you all. And uh, we want to pray and we'll be finished. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to be a part of your church. Thank you for allowing us to be together today. And God, I pray that you bless our church. Bless those that are looking for jobs or have lost jobs. I pray that you'd bless those and protect those from disease, especially the coronavirus. God, I pray that you'd heal those that have contracted this. And Lord, we want to thank you today for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.